over the past few months, I've been looking into the physics of radar systems and some general background information on that. And one topic I came across was how to calculate the Doppler shift frequency of a target that's approaching a radar system at a very fast speed. Now, when you do this, uh, radar systems, you know, they emit beams hoping to hit a target and then those beams come back. When you're trying to calculate that frequency, what frequency you would expect based upon the velocity of that object, what you find is that if you fail to include relativistic effects, or if you do not account for Einstein's theory of special relativity, what you calculate will be incorrect. It will not conform to what you actually observe in nature. So, given that fact, I started reviewing special relativity, looking into that again, derivations and stuff. I found it very interesting, so I thought, why not teach you guys about special relativity? It'll be fun. And, you know, this is a very cool topic, one of the coolest topics in physics, okay? A lot of Einstein stuff in this, okay? So, what I intend to do in this video is I want to provide some background information, some history, some background theory, and some ideas related to relativity to help you better understand the general climate that scientists were encroached in back in the day when Einstein made his breakthrough discovery in a paper he published in 1905. I want you to understand the dilemma everybody faced, what they were trying to solve, and why Einstein's pretty straightforward idea, you know, he developed all this stuff through a very simple thought experiment, why this was such a huge, huge breakthrough in physics. One that segmented physics in half between classical physics and modern physics in a sense. Okay, so first and foremost, we're talking about relativity. What exactly is relativity? Well, as with most sects in uh, uh, physics, most topics in physics, the name conveys the meaning, right? The terminology conveys the physical phenomena. So this is no different. Relativity. If you look at it and break down the word, the main root word here is relative. Relativity is the study of how our perceptions of physical phenomena, how our conception of the universe and how things transpire in front of us, how that is contingent upon the reference frame from which we conceive it. Again, our perceptions are contingent upon our perspective, our reference frame. In essence, if somebody perceives something in a certain way based upon their reference frame and somebody else perceives it in a different, from a different perspective, uh, the outcomes, the analysis, um, how they interpret that, it may not gel up together. So what relativity is trying to do, it's trying to bridge the gap between perceptions from different perspectives such that we can get some universal, absolute conception of the universe. Now, this can crop up in physics or metaphysical ideas, right? In metaphysics, philosophy, opinions, even politics, for example. Somebody's perception, somebody's interpretation of things, it's based upon their perspective. It's based upon how they saw things. It's based upon what information they had available. But in terms of physics, Relativity has to do with measurements, okay? The way in which you measure length, time, velocity, momentum, so on and so forth, but in particular space and time, what you find is that your conception of reality, your conception of how physical laws are played out in front of your eyes, it's contingent upon your perspective. It is dependent upon your reference frame, okay? And this is a very cool idea because what physics is trying to do is we want to divulge the essence of the universe. All the physical principles that govern motion, govern how things are supposed to be, right? Any good physical theory is one that should encompass every event that could happen in the universe, every perspective 
that could observe that kind of phenomenon, it should be absolute. It should be universal. So any kind of theory of relativity is trying to do that. It's trying to find this absolute universal conception of reality that bridges differences between perspectives. Okay. And what I'm going to say is that relativity, the conception of it is very, very old. So it did not come about for the first time in history when Einstein developed his theory of special relativity. Uh, uh, uh. When it came about was back in the day when Newton was developing his theories. This is a very classical idea, it's a very classical idea. So what Newton was trying to do, he wanted all of his laws to be universal across these reference frames, okay? And when we observe different phenomena throughout the day in the, you know, general terms, things that are moving at a slow speed, key word, keep that in mind in the back of your head, slow speed, we find that different perspectives, you know, they can converge based upon transformations. So what Newton showed, first what he said is that there is something known as Gal Gal Galilean invariance. This is part of Newtonian mechanics. What this basically asserts is that physical laws are universal. They're absolute. Regardless of how you perceive something, regardless of your reference frame, regardless of your perspective, the same physical phenomenon will arise. Things will behave as they are governed by physical laws, right? Nature is not going to play a fast one on us. It's not going to try to trick us until we get into the quantum world. That's what makes it super interesting. But in the Newtonian world, Newton's laws are going to arise just as they are. So Galilean invariance, a formal definition, states that if Newton's laws are valid in one reference frame for one person, for one perspective, then they are also valid in an in inertial reference frame, keyword inertial, moving at a constant velocity v relative to the first system. So, the theory of special relativity is only for inertial reference frames that are moving at a constant velocity. So, as you probably learned in Physics 101, an inertial reference frame is which the laws are, they are the dominant governing force at play. They always apply. That's why it's sort of inertial. Newton's laws give rise to inertial concepts. And any other reference frame has to have a constant velocity relative to the first system. So, to illustrate the initial problem that was faced with Newtonian relativity, which people thought was no big deal, right? They said, oh, there's this dilemma. They solved it very quickly, which I'll show you in, 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 a, uh, in a little bit. And they said, this is not interesting. We're not going to look at this ever again until Einstein came around. And a dilemma was presented that he was trying to solve, which I'll get to in a second. But let's do a thought experiment. Let's do a thought experiment. Let's see if we had multiple perspectives if the laws are valid. If space and time can be related in a universal absolute sense. Okay? That's the name of the game. So... To do this, what we're going to do is we're going to say, we've got two people who are going to conduct this experiment. A guy named Terence and a guy named Philip, denoted by T and P. Now, Terence is going to be in a car, and he's going to drive at a constant velocity and throw an object and measure it. Philip is also going to measure it, standing on the ground. So, Philip and Terence, what they do, they say, my... Reference frames are designated as follows. Philip's reference frame, his perspective of the physical phenomenon transpiring all around him, is going to be a reference frame S. And Terence is going to be a reference frame S prime. Now Terence is only going to move in the X direction, not going to move in the Y direction or the Z direction coming out of the board, but the S reference frame is going to have an X and Y system at the origin, and before this, the experiment is conducted, what Terence is going to do is to say, hey, I have a clock, Philip has a clock, we're going to synchronize that clock. This reference system, S prime for Terence, 
which is designated by X prime and Y prime, it's going to be fixed to this car. But initially, it's going to line up with the origin O. So Terence's origin, which is going to move with the car, I'll call it O prime. His origin is going to be as follows. So, first tenet of relativity back in the day, Newtonian relativity, if you will. You could probably agree that the time for Philip is going to be the same time as Terence, provided that they sync up, right? For example, if we both have a clock which is calibrated properly, it's a good tool, good instrument, we set it together, I stay at home and I tell you, hey, take your watch, go to the supermarket, keep track of your time, pick up some chicken, we'll make some Chinese food when he comes back, something like that. When he comes back, you and I would agree. We would agree. Time would be the same. Our watches would match, provided that the tool was precise. That's not surprising. That's a given fact of life that we observe every day. So that's not surprising. So, Terence and Philip, they're gonna do that. They're gonna synchronize their watch at time t equals zero. And right when they wanna start the experiment, Terence, he's gonna hit a pedal that makes him automatically go to the speed of v, v relative. In this case, we're gonna go 60 meters per second. And they're gonna start their time watches at the same exact time so their time will be universal. So the transformation that's gonna relate time between reference frame S prime and S, time T for Philip is gonna be the same as T prime for Terence. Not surprising. Now, Terence, he's gonna start speeding off. Then he's gonna throw a baseball right here and he's gonna measure it. So Terrence throws it, whoosh, throws the ball, shoo, flies out. Terrence says, mm, look at that smirk, baby. I'm gonna measure that baseball. It's 10 meters per second. It's 10 meters per second. So he gives a call to his buddy. Hey bro, yo Philip. I measured the speed. It's 10 meters per second. What did you measure? What'd you measure? Well, Philip says, oh, oh my God, what are you talking about, man? You, you're lying to me, bro. You're lying to me. I see 70 meters per second. What's going on here? Has the universe played a trick on Terrence and Philip? Well, you're probably thinking this is sort of silly. And right now it is silly because we know that and I'm going to show you very shortly that, you know, we just take the velocity of this and add the velocity of that. 60 plus 10 gives us 70. And we're used to that. Because we're used to everyday events transpiring in front of us. Right? I, I say kids are like the best physicists because they observe everything, observe how things are going to operate, and then form their own theories related to it. And they would have formed some kind of theory related to this. But since they disagree, what they say is, oh... Bro, let's, let's take a step back and let's analyze what the distances are going to be. So at a time t, we say that if Terence is moving at a constant velocity v, his car will have traveled a distance vt, right? Makes sense. Simple physics, right? V is delta L over delta T. If you multiply by delta T, you get delta L. That's just what that is. Simple physics, baby. Simple physics. So he says, oh, you traveled a distance Vt in blue right here, V relative times T. That's gonna give me your conception of the car. And you're gonna tell me that the length you see the ball has traveled is relative to your origin, which is implanted on the car, which is the distance from where, where uh, your origin is, right here at the left side of the car, to the ball. 
that's going to be x prime, right? His reference frame is designated by a prime. That's x prime. But what I see is that it traveled first this distance in the car, and then the distance you threw it. So my distance x is going to be x prime plus vt, which is what we find here. So okay, that, that makes sense. And I want to make a note that when he throws it, it just goes in the x direction. So we don't have any change in y. So you can make, oh, well, that's cool. Maybe that's why there's a difference. But as for y and z, so y, your y is the same as mine. They line up horizontally. Same with z out of the board. Nothing's changing there. Our, our reference frames aren't affecting that. So what this gives rise to, and what we just derived, is a very simple idea of relativity. What it says is that, you know what? We haven't proved this yet. It says the laws of physics are going to hold. They're universal. They're absolute. They govern nature. Nature will conform to those laws, whatever, for, regardless of what we do. But our perspectives may be changing the phenomena that arise. So in order to come up with this absolute universal conception, we're going to develop this transformation, which we're going to call Galilean transformation, and it is as follows. So given this, we say, okay, we have this universal conception of the physical phenomena that happened. It's true regardless of the reference frame that we choose. It's going to stay true regardless of what we choose. And it is as such. Now, we could further generalize this by saying that, oh, if this is going to move in, in a constant velocity in the z direction or the y direction, we could vectorialize this and say that r you know, vector r, which is x, y, z, sorry about that guys, vector like that, we say r for Philip is equal to the r for Terence prime, that's what the prime designates, it's with respect to his reference frame, plus the relative velocity times t. This is going to represent vx, vy, vz. So we could have done that. We could have done that, and this gives us this nice transformation. But you're saying, wait a second. That's just space. How does this affect velocity? How does this affect velocity? So if we erase our invariance principle, which we hold to be true, and we want to be true because that is the goal of physics, to assert that laws are universal and crop up in nature, regardless of how we perceive them. All you can say is that, oh, we can take this general form, r is equal to r prime plus v relative t. And we can just differentiate this, right? Simple calc, baby. We could say, okay, r dot, I'll transform it to V, is equal to V prime. The derivative, this is a constant, remember. He's moving at a constant velocity. So the derivative of a constant times T is just the constant. And then you say, well, Terence, you told me the velocity you observed, V prime, is 10 meters per second. I have to add your velocity, which is 60, and that gives me my 70. Everything makes sense. Everything makes sense. This is known as velocity addition, okay? So, what have we done here? What have we really done? We came up with a mechanism to con conceive of the world, to perceive physical phenomena around us in an absolute universe, universal manner. We say that regardless of how we perceive things, regardless of our perspective, it's going to conform to physical laws, and it's going to give rise to this theory that applies regardless of your reference frame. 
cool stuff. But what about that invariance principle? How can we show that Newton's laws are the same in each reference frame? That's one of the accomplishments of physics. I'm just going to write what I erased right here. Velocity addition. Okay. Okay. So all I want to show really is Philip says, I took the baseball, I dropped it on a spring scale, I measured the force that was going on here, the force of gravity. My force should be the same as yours if physical laws are going to line up. That's how it has to be. This was the dilemma back in the day for Newtonian mechanics. So you might be reasoning that regardless of your reference frame, regardless of your perspective, it seems to be the case that your mass in one reference frame will be the same mass in another reference frame. Seems plausible, right? We cannot create or destroy mass. Conservation of mass, right? So, Philip says, let's test this out. Terence, take the ball, travel as fast as you can. Take my spring balance, so it's the same instrument. Drop that baseball on it and measure it. Tell me your force. We want to find that this is equal to that. The forces in both reference frame are equal. So, when he does this, all right, the spring balance, he says, oh, the forces are equal. That seems plausible. We've all probably done that, and we probably consider that subconsciously based upon what we observed in the world in front of us, based upon how physical phenomena has transpired around us. So, you could probably agree that mass is invariant in your reference frame. For now. <laughs> and you're probably thinking, since he measured it, the tool does not lie. So this is true. But what about acceleration? What about acceleration? Acceleration must be the same to make that line up. Right? So if we take this, we can differentiate it again. Note that V relative is a constant. And we end up with A is equal to A prime. What that means is we get that this is equivalent F equals MA. Looks like invariance is held up. Our physical laws to give rise to inertial effects, they're universal. Philip and Terence are happy. The only thing they are unhappy about is space, their conception of space. And they came up with this nice universal conception to measure it. Okay? So you might be thinking, that's all nice, that's all fine and dandy, sure as he is. This cannot be the theory of special relativity. That's uninteresting. And I agree with you. It's not super interesting. So what's the problem? Well, my question for you is, this little experiment here. Does this encompass every possible situation that can arise in the universe? Because if our physical theory is true, what it should do is it should converge upon every situation that can happen. That is the ultimate test for any physical theory. Can this encompass every situation? What I'm going to say is no. We have not tested every single situation that could arise. And in particular, we have not checked that invariance is true for every physical law. Okay? So next, what we're going to do is I'm going to outline the main dilemma back in the day that was presented, which challenged Einstein and gave him a run for his money and allowed him to become the famous physicist he is today.